Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. In those days, Mary arose and went in haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we will not abide forever in this life, but your word abides forever. And those who trust in your word will have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. And I pray that that truth, the truth of your word, would be indelible, imprinted on us today, as we need it so badly to be, for the sake of millions of lives, not only in this life, but for eternal life, for the sake of giving glory to you for your created purpose and your redeeming purposes. I pray that we would conform to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This is a big week in the history of our nation. This past Monday, a majority decision draft of the Supreme Court was leaked. For the first time in history, a decision was leaked before it was given by the Supreme Court. And that decision regards Roe versus Wade, a monumental ruling that the federal government would not restrict access to abortion, originally under limited conditions, but more and more those conditions are broadening and increasing and many states today. The decision would mean that the individual states would be given the right to determine whether or not they would recognize abortion on demand or limit abortion. And as you probably know, the leak itself was unprecedented. As I said, never has this happened in the history of our country, and that very fact teaches us something about the issue, and that is this, it's a sacred issue. It's a sacred issue. Either the right to it is sacred by those who want the right, or the restriction of it to those who desire it be restricted, not merely because they want laws, but because life is sacred. And so this is a matter of that which is sacred, as is evident by those who are opposed to abortion restrictions. If you've seen their reactions lately, you see that this is a sacred matter to them. This is a sacred cow, if you will. And when that sacred cow is taken away, or when that idol is removed, the people of Ephesus 
the idol worshipers will respond in anger. And they will protest and they will riot and things will be burned down if this decision goes through. You can depend on, I'm not a prophet, but you can depend on it. Today there are churches that are not just being protested against, but in a lewd and profane way, the destruction of life of children is being actually displayed in the public. And this happens around the world. I saw not long ago in Argentina while the debate was raging, women would be walking through the streets covered in blood and the depiction would be of the gruesome act of self-induced abortion. And some are not squeamish at all to say we should have a right to openly and without restriction seek the end of the life of our children. This is not anymore the debate of our grandfathers which said that it should be few and far between and it should be a private decision and it should be personal. Now it's shouted. Shout your abortion. This is a sacred act now. And today you can address, I, I could address this matter in many ways to tell you that I am absolutely opposed to abortion. I think because the word of God brings me to that conclusion. But I want to really, I believe, I, I believe I want to get to the heart of this issue. And it may not be where you think that is. You may think the heart of that issue is human sexuality. How we express ourselves in sexual relationship, that is not the heart of this issue. The heart of this issue is not medical freedom, personal freedom, privacy is not the heart of this issue. One reason we know that is because the same people that, were, <laughs> that are saying, my body, my choice now, were not saying that when the vaccine was being mandated on people. What, regardless of your position on those matters, we know that my body, my choice is not an absolute position. It depends on what is being argued for, right? Medical autonomy is not the grounds of this problem. My assertion this morning, and I'm gonna to try to bring this forward from scripture, is that the grounds of the pursuit of the murder of our babies in the womb comes at the very base, the very first chapters in Genesis that teach us that men and women are distinct in God's created purpose or role for them. I believe the matter of abortion begins there. I believe it rests upon the distinction that God in his created purpose, when he made everything good, and even as that sustains even after the fall, if we don't see those distinctions, abortion cannot be limited. That's what I'm gonna assert this morning. That's the beginning of it. You see, it's been asserted that absolute equality between men and women devalues, or it's been asserted that absolute equality between men and women is necessary for a modern and equitable or fair society. You might, well, that does sound good. And I'm gonna tell you something this morning. Some of these things I'm gonna say to you in your ears are gonna, they're gonna seem like a chalkboard the scratching on the, the chalkboard. You know why? Because we don't hear them. We were talking about this before the service. What we hear out there all the time is contrary to what you're gonna hear today. But I wanna submit to you that here is scripture. Here's the word of God. And I believe it's a faithful understanding. My, my assertion, first of all, is absolute equality between men and women in fact devalues men and women. 
and the roles we play. My goal is to exalt motherhood this morning. I'm not going to speak as much to men as I am to women and the role of motherhood, but they do relate. Necessarily, they relate. Fundamental to the distinction between men and women in the scriptures is that men, women have been given a role of bearing children while men have not. Now that shouldn't be controversial, right? Now you have the emojis on your phone and on Facebook of a man with, the, with an impregnated womb. That is impossible. And neither should we desire it. To desire it is to demean women and to devalue women. And this comes with a blessing. It comes with a blessing that men and women are to, were made in the image of God, both male and female. He created them both in the image of God. And he blessed them, Genesis 1.28. Husband and wife of 224, that's who he blesses in this, what's called the dominion mandate. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And so chapter 2 tells us that Adam could not do this by himself. <laughs> he needed somebody that was fit for him, suitable for him, in order to fulfill this mandate. This very good mandate, and that somebody was taken from his rib. Adam was first form. Eve was taken from his rib, we read. And now Eve, or the mother of life, is born. Given life. Not born as we would understand, but given life. And so we see from the very beginning this distinction is, is, is brought forth with the blessing. Be fruitful and multiply. And it has to do with Adam and Eve. And it's very clear that Eve is the one bearing out the role of mother in this relationship. We see that especially in chapter 3. But what happened in chapter 3? The fall happened in chapter 3. Adam and Eve sinned. Right? But then we read in chapter 3 verse 16 that as a result of sin there was a curse. And that curse affected the peculiar, the particular, rather, qualities of manhood and womanhood at their base, at the fundamental nature of them both. We see how the curse affected each one. Verse 16, we see how the curse affected women. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, there's debate whether that ruling is evidently implied here as a negative thing. That means, as a result of the curse, he will not rule in a, in a generous, in a kind, in a loving, in a righteous way always, is the idea. There's two things here, though, that we need to understand, is that this fruitful labor of a woman that was blessed is now coupled with pain and hardship and sorrow and difficulty. What we don't see is the taking away of the mandate. We don't see the removal of the mandate. Rather, we see as you carry out your mandate, it will be hard for you. And we know that because what it says about men comes next. God says to Adam in verse 17 and 19, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. From the dust you are, and to the dust you shall return. Therefore a wife is primarily distinguished by her role as a mother and in relationship to her husband, while men are primarily known by their role as leader and laborer, and both fulfill their role because of sin with much difficulty and imperfection.
in this world. And anybody who's a mother can say to this, amen. And anybody who knows a mother or who's had a mother and has seen that can say to this, amen. And anybody who's a man can say, oh, it sure is true that I labor seemingly in a futile way. You know, all the labor that we do when we're young and we're strong and we're able and we're capable, pretty soon that starts to wear on us. Right now I have a pain, like a dull pain in the top of my back. Part of this curse. Part of what it means to be man and woman in a fallen world. Now this can be contrasted, what the scriptures say here, with the essential arguments for absolute egalitarianism or equality between the sexes, as related, especially in this context, to abortion. They say, well, women cannot be equals of men. Usually this regards in their thinking with matters of social importance. Rarely does it have to do with mining jobs or being a trash collector. Often it has to do with, oh, I can be a CEO. I can be a leader. I can be one who takes up the reins and shows men how it's done in the workplace. But I can't do that if abortion's not legal. Because what happens if I do have a child? Well, it's gonna make my aspirations for greatness, which by the way, if I could just put this in your minds, it's true. The world by greatness means women being like men. You hear that, women? That is not how God defines your greatness as a woman, that you be like men. Now, that's not all there is to say about that. I don't believe it's wrong or sinful that women work outside the home in essence. It could be, but not essentially. But I just want you to understand something here. This is the argument. Women cannot be equals of men if they're stuck at home having children. And not only that, but children are not easy to have. There's problems that arise. One of the hardships of motherhood is that mothers are more probably intimately related to their children than men possibly could be, and yet there's hardships. Children aren't always healthy. Sometimes children die in childbearing. Sometimes children die at a young age. Sometimes that union between mother and child is broken and it's hard and it bears a difficulty on them that perhaps men can't totally understand. And the scriptures are saying, yep, yeah, right at the beginning, that's the way it will be to carry out this mandate that I gave you. It's gonna be hard because of sin. It's gonna be hard. Add to that that the sinfulness of men only seems to increase more and more the burden of women. You know, single mothers account for over 85% of all abortions. And they're single for a reason. Perhaps not always can you attribute that reason to men alone. But a man has responsibility in every single one of those abortions. Everyone. I'll talk more about that later. Women cannot be equal, it is said, if they do not have access to abortion. But I want us to see this morning that the very thing that the world is crying out for is not in the first place contrary to scripture in regards to abortion, but in the first place it's contrary to the very distinction of manhood and womanhood. It's the cry out that there is no difference between me as a man and you as a woman. And there is. There is a distinction. God created us, man and woman, for a distinct purpose.
God sets the role of men and women. What is a woman? That's the big question today, isn't it? Where are we going when we reject these roles? Where do we end up? Whenever you reject God's wisdom, you always have to substitute it with man's. Where have we gone to today? In the foolishness of men. There is no gender right now. There is no difference. We will be so bold to say at all. If your little girl wants to be an it, not even a male, a they, a whatever, a figment of her imagination, that's what she is. Why? Because we tell God our creator, that is not who I am. Who I am is not who you say I am. Now, these roles do not comprehend all that the scriptures say about men and women, but they are foundational. And that's what I want us to see. We need to see the created distinction between man and woman if we are to value men and women as distinct. Value them as united, as both being made in the image of God, and value them in the distinct role in which they play in God's created and redemptive purposes. Do you have the biblical context for that? Well, one of those ways that we do that is through promise. We see the value of men and women, especially this morning I'm focusing on motherhood, in the promises of God. You know, before we get to the curses, here's the joy of the Christian. Before we get to the curses after the fall, we see a promise, don't we? In Genesis 3.15. In God's mercy, the promise comes before the announcement of curse. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. But he shall bruise your head. That is, the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. You see, this is one of the things that motherhood needs to grab onto. God's promise had to do with motherhood here at the very beginning. You hear that? What if we do away with the distinction of manhood and womanhood? Where do the promises of God go? Where do the promises of our salvation go? What we read there should be understood as the first promise for hope for all humanity. And it comes through the offspring, the seed of the woman. And I believe this is the foundation in Genesis for the basis of several biblical truths. And the first is that mothers must be honored. Mothers must be honored. The fifth command says, honor your father and mother that your days may be long on the land, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now this honoring was not merely for the formality of keeping positions of authority in place, although that's central to this command. This is the only command, Paul says, with a promise. What does that promise extend to? That promise, it says here, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. That promise extends back to the promise that God gave Abraham. I'm going to give you a land promise. Now, I don't have time to teach through that, but that land promise, if you read through the Old Testament, seemingly grows and grows and grows until it encompasses the whole world in Romans chapter 4. That Abraham would be the inheritor of the, co of the cosmos, the world there, is the idea. And what does that mean? That means the nations would be brought in to the family of God through promise. But what is at the root of it? Honor your mother and your father. And honor to mother and father would be at the basis of the accept, expect, expectancy of the fulfillment of the promise of God. 
to receive a land which to us we should understand as regards eternal life, new heavens, new earth. Second, blessings in the Old Testament was this defined many times in accordance with having children. Deuteronomy 28, 11, in the blessings that God would bestow on his people if they would be obedient to the commands and fulfill the covenant obligations. He says, the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The fruit of your womb. These blessings agree not merely with having, but having these things in abundance. While they were contrasted, we see with the curses, if they disobeyed the Lord, if they didn't fulfill the covenant, the curses said in verse 18, curse shall be the fruit of your womb. There'd be a lack. You remember when Israel is in Egypt and now they have a Pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. And Pharaoh looks out on, on Israel and Israel is just having children left and right and they're just uh, blessed in the land and they are multiplying and Pharaoh says why are they so abundant and he's he's scared of them now because they're so fruitful and he says to the midwives kill them be you know when they're having their babies make sure they don't come out or however have them aborted or whatever and and the midwives come because Pharaoh finds out it's not working and the midwives come back to Pharaoh and they say they're having them too early they're so healthy, the babies are just coming out before we can even get to them. That was a picture of blessing upon God's people. And Pharaoh was in fear of it. Oh, that Pharaoh would be in fear of the church of Christ with the blessings that abound because of the wombs that bring forth life in the church. I believe Elizabeth believed this blessing when she said to Mary, when she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women. Listen to those words. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now that's particular to Mary for sure. But that idea of blessing surely was indelible in Elizabeth who was a righteous woman. You are blessed to have this child in your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And from this brief peering into this most intimate moment between these two, we can see that God's people should have the highest view of childbearing both in relationship to the mother and the child. In this scene, think of this, the promises of God are being fulfilled to the extent that the very intricacies of the relationship of mother and child while the baby is in the womb are described to us. Personhood is seen here exceedingly clear. Mary is the mother, she says, of Elizabeth's Lord. She's already the mother of Elizabeth's Lord. Where is her Lord? In the womb. Jesus is yet in the womb, very early, in fact, <laughs> in the pregnancy. John is filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Here's something unique, because Elizabeth's cry is said to come from the filling of the Holy Spirit, and yet John is professed or promised in chapter 1, verse 15, to be full of the Holy Spirit. And so what you have here, perhaps, is a mother who's filled with the Holy Spirit, praising God for what he's doing in Mary, and the child doing flips, gymnastics in the womb, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Both filled with the Holy Spirit upon the news that God's promise, which he first gave back in Genesis 3.15, that his seed, this seed would crush the serpent, is being fulfilled. Blessed are you, the mother of my Lord, while that Lord is still in her womb. Do you have a high view of life yet unborn? From this scene of two mothers and their yet-to-be-born sons, salvation comes to the world. Do you understand that? 
This is what we're looking at in Luke or in Mark's gospel right now. The herald and the one who would prepare the one who would prepare the way of Yahweh himself. We're seeing this scene right in front of us as these children are in the womb and the Bible calls them babies. Persons. But in fact, it might surprise you that many professed believers come to this text and they say, well, in fact, in the New Testament is exactly why we think that there is more of an egalitarian, equality, non-distinct roles that men and women play. It's exactly because Jesus came, they'll say, that we see those roles that were from the beginning clear, we see those as displaced now that Jesus has come. And it's no surprise that most of the people that hold that view are also very okay with abortion. They probably hold the old standard of it should be limited and it shouldn't be often, but, but they're okay with it. And they're also okay with women being preachers and elders and pastors, and they're also okay with homosexuals more often than not being now openly accepted in the church without repentance. Now, if you struggle with that, we want to be with you while you struggle with that. But they'll accept it. It's okay that you're that way, and it's okay you live in that, and be married, and all of that. They affirm it. They congratulate people because the roles have lost their meaning. Well, has the New Testament, because of Christ and his fulfillment, done away with the distinction of roles? Some go, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says they did. What does that say? There is neither Jew or Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. Wow. For you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. Now, every Christian should rejoice at that text. But that text used as a means to flatten out roles that God has put in scripture or distinction of manhood and womanhood is not what Paul intends. Absolutely. There is a context for those roles being flattened out. And what is that context? All who are in Christ Jesus. That means this. If you today, sinner though you are, believe in the gospel, God does not accept you because you are male or female or Jew or Greek or slave or free, not on an economic basis, not a societal basis, not a covenantal basis in regards to the old covenant, not a racial basis. It's probably not the right term to use. None of that accounts for why you were accepted. You are accepted because of Jesus Christ. Faith in him is why God accepts you. Your union by faith in Jesus is what makes you absolutely equal in value to God, no matter who you are. And so we should rejoice at that text. God does not accept me for my failures or for who I am, outwardly speaking. Does it do away with God's formative roles between man and woman while we live on this earth? In fact, the New Testament grounds Christian conduct between husband and wife, man and woman, and the church on the Genesis account. Ephesians 5.31, which quotes Genesis 2.24, is a binding principle of the New Testament. Jesus quotes this as well. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. When Jesus teaches on divorce, this is the text he goes to in Genesis. Now, Paul also holds forth roles of distinction among men and women in the church, which is called the household of God, three separate times by different apostles. 
In Ephesians, 1 Timothy, and 1 Peter, the church is called the household of God. 1 Timothy 2.12. Some of you are going to have to twist your ears on a little bit to hear this this morning. Here's the word of God. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Now, where is the context for what he's speaking about? He's speaking about this within the church. The next chapter is the qualification for elders and deacons. Paul is specifically clear that what he's doing here regards relationships of manhood and womanhood within the church. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, this regards to taking to herself a role of a teacher in the church, an authoritative role in the church. For Adam was first formed. Now he, he grounds that teaching on Scripture, verse 13 and 14. But the Scripture comes from the Genesis account, creation account. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, and became a transgressor. Now there's three theological reasons from the Genesis account that are set forward here that concerns roles of men and women in the church, which is the household of God. There's a family context to this we should have in our mind. First, Adam was formed first. You, you read that there? Adam was formed first. Second, Eve transgressed first. Now we know that Adam does, or that Paul doesn't mean that Eve was the reason that men fell. He doesn't give Adam uh, an excuse here. He doesn't give Adam Adam's own excuse. Oh, it's the woman's fault. Remember Adam? It's her fault. He's not doing that because in Romans chapter 5, he says all of mankind fell in Adam's sin. In fact, he's doing the opposite. Because Adam was to be the responsible one, when Eve took on that role, he's saying it was inverted. The role was inverted. And that was what, what the serpent was beguiling. He came not to Adam, but to Eve. Not to the responsible one, Adam, but to Eve. The role is inverted there. And the transgression happened because the role was inverted. That's Paul's point. And so that is a pattern. Adam, Adam forced Eve, or formed first. He should have been the responsible one. Eve falling is the pattern for why Paul does not permit a woman to hold or exercise authority over men in the church, the household of God. You see, there's a, a marital context to this idea still. And third, as I mentioned, that indicates a reversal of roles. That's the problem, Paul says here, a reversal of roles. Paul is saying that women are not permitted to have authority over men in the church because of the authority of the roles that God gave to men and woman, woman man and woman, at the very beginning. In other words, that those roles hold true now. That's the basis of his argument. And he argues this way throughout many other aspects of the New Testament, and other places in the New Testament. But he's done something else at the beginning. Remember what he said? He said, be fruitful and multiply. And then we read in 1 Timothy 2.15, if you're still there, yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is one of the hardest and most enigmatic texts in the New Testament, I think. It's a very difficult text to really nail down. What does, what does Paul mean? I'll, let me say what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean that woman, women out there, if you've had a baby, God will accept you as righteous because you've had a baby. Let me go that far in saying that's not what Paul means. I believe Paul is connecting the promises given back in Genesis chapter 3, 15 and 16 
to believing women so as to remind them that their calling is no small task. You see, what he's just said to women is that I do not permit you to have authority over men in the household of God. And he's not saying that to them to demean them. And this is what you need to hear. I pray that you hear it, especially women these days and men too. Because we better not be guilty of demeaning women. The roles that God has placed is not to demean either men or women, but so that salvation would be seen in how those roles are carried out. In the teaching ministry of the church, the proclaiming of the gospel, salvation comes to the hearers. And here's the profound thing. I think Paul means to say, now it's debated, is he meaning Eve? Is he meaning Mary? Is he meaning all women? Is it, what is he meaning here? She, they will be saved through childbearing. I, I believe he means the fulfillment of the promise given in Genesis 3.15 and 16 as it relates to even to the curse. The fulfillment of salvation comes through childbearing. In general, what does that mean? Apart from childbearing, there is no salvation. Think of that. Think of that for a minute. If we are not having children, salvation cannot come to the children we're not having. <laughs> I mean, it's, it may be strange to think that way, but this is sort of how a Christian should see childbearing. By having children, we are giving opportunity to eternal souls for everlasting joy. And apart from it, there is no salvation. Now, that's, that's not all that I think that Paul is saying there, but I do think that is part of what he's saying. It's as if God is saying through Paul to the church, although I have not called you to lead, I have something particular for you to do that men cannot do, which is necessary for salvation. Because everybody who will have salvation will have been born, will have life. If I could say it that way. Now, this regards salvation as well, I think, in the theological sense. And what does that mean? Go to John 16. John 16. Jesus is about to leave his disciples. He's telling them he's going to leave them in a little while. And, he, and he's going to give them an analogy of joy. Is this why you're asking yourself in verse 19, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When will that turn to joy? When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born in the world. So also you have sour, sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. What's he saying here? That salvation is not merely an immediate thing. We are saved, we are being saved, and there is a future to our salvation. And I think the idea of 
the, the theological understanding that there is a future for us leads us to do hard things. It teaches us doing a hard thing like submission in the church in the role that God calls us to do. We don't give that up without blessing. It teaches us that doing hard things, having children, hard things, is not without blessing, future hope. There is an aspect, I think, in this very veiled description in 1 Timothy 2.15 that believing women should say, thank you, God, for the opportunity to fulfill this role of bearing children. And that the church should exalt in it as well. One last thing. The promise is for us, the Bible says, and for our children. Christian mothers especially, if you're a believing mother today, and you say to yourself, oh, or, or you're not a mother yet, and you say, I don't know if I should have children. I don't know if I want to have children. Why should I bring children into this world that's so wicked? Peter says, the promise is for you and your children. The promise of the gospel. Christians should be bringing up children, if we're able. If we're able, we should be bringing up children. The promise is not for us, mom and dad, merely. It's for our children. You have an opportunity to bring children into this world, not just for a life in this world, which is hard, which is fraught with all sorts of dangers but so that in this world they may know Jesus and have joys which are unspeakable and full of glory. That should be part of the decision-making of motherhood in the Christian home. Application, quickly. Christians must exalt motherhood in this world, especially within the context of marriage, as good and normative. We should never speak evil or in a demeaning way of motherhood. We must praise God for faithful and redeemed mothers. We should seek to establish in our society a conscience that mothers are honored in proportion with the scriptures. And although women are certainly valuable in other roles, hear that. Scripture reveals that's true. Motherhood is foundational to feminine distinctives. Apart from it, there is no fundamental distinctiveness between man and woman. Motherhood is that, that, that fundamental distinctive quality that places value on women in distinction to men. If we do not teach and admonish one another of the importance of mother motherhood, if we do not support mothers, we will be in danger of supporting the very mechanism that supports the murder of over 60 million babies in almost 50 years, coming up to 50 years. But I wanna qualify that. Some women are unable to have children and will be burdened to a greater or lesser degree in proportion to how we celebrate godly motherhood. This doesn't mean that we should not celebrate godly motherhood, but to those who do not have children or who cannot have children, I wanna say first, recognize that this is no indication of your position in Christ. God accepts you as you are. He accepts you as you are. If you're not able to have children, and you are in Christ Jesus. He loves you with an everlasting love. Your value is not diminished in his sight at all. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are his child and he loves you with an everlasting love. Second, it is also not a chastisement that you are especially sinful if you don't have children as a woman. 
Elizabeth, the Bible says, was righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. She was past the age of having children, and she was barren her whole life, and that's what it says about her. Third, recognize that God may still give you children. God cannot be limited. Shall anything be impossible for God? That comes within the context of barrenness in women. In Luke's narrative, first chapter. Pray for a faith that does not limit what God can do. The, the faith of Sarah, who couldn't have children, or Rebecca, who couldn't have children, and Rachel, who couldn't have children, Hannah, who couldn't have children, S uh, Samson's mother, who couldn't have children, Elizabeth, who couldn't have children, Mary, who couldn't have children, the way that she had a child, right? Do not limit what God can do. Fourth, consider how you may more faithfully serve Christ in your condition, if that be what God keeps you in. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 will be of help to you. You will have the ability to serve God in ways that mothers would be restricted just because of the practical time that it takes to raise children. You may even have a role to play in adoption, especially. Because if we, and as we cry out for the abolishment of abortion, we should stand ready to receive, as we're able, children into our homes. You know, I'm not gonna go there. Children are going to all sorts of homes nowadays. Chil adopted children, children that are fatherless and motherless are going to all kinds of homes and we despise. In this culture, let me say this, they despise mothers. One way we know that is because it says that two men can have the same impact on children in a home that a mother and a father can have. That is to despise motherhood. Two men cannot raise children the way a mother can raise a child in a home with a father. If we have opportunity to adopt, pray for it. If you don't have children, if you can't have children, pray for it. Seek it. Second qualification to a high view of motherhood. While we should oppose sex outside of marriage, we should strive to help single, single mothers as loving neighbors and gospel witnesses. Sex outside of marriage, fornication, is an implicit and explicit rejection of God's created purposes for man and woman. It is a great sin. Yet both for the sake of the soul of the woman and her child, and in confidence in the gospel, we should not neglect and forsake and, and cast out single mothers. But we should be neighborly to them and helpful to them. And especially, we should bear witness of the gospel of hope to them as Christians. Qualification number three. Men, listen up, here we go. Men, we are responsible in Scripture in exalting motherhood. Men must not be silenced on the importance of motherhood. One way that we will silence the importance of motherhood is if we are absentee fathers and husbands. That is, we are not taking the role that God placed on us to lead in love our families. Your wife will not 
be as capable and as strong and as joyful in her motherhood as she would be if you would fulfill your role, father and husband, as a leader who leads by love and understanding of your wife. Not as domineering and abusive and not as absentee, which is equal to that, in a sense. It's time for men to get a voice again in this society for the sake of women. Let me say that. Do you hear that? What is happening in the world, the feminism that's being pushed upon our daughters and our children and your ears for these years hurts women. How many women have been aborted? Half at least of the 60 million. How many single mothers are there? That's a group that is growing exponentially in our society. And we know poverty increases exponentially with every single mother. And men are told, you don't have a role to play. And the more that we believe that lie, the more that sin will keep continuing to roll, and the more we will be rolled over as a society, and we won't have anything left. And it's coming. It's coming sooner than we know, or we expect, I think. You, I, I really don't think it's disconnected to see the homelessness, the, the economic uh, recklessness that we have as a nat nation. All these things are connected to whether or not we will believe God and we will follow his created precepts and his moral laws. And fathers and husbands have an important role to play in that. Men, we must be sexually pure. Single mothers aren't single mothers by accident. They're not supernaturally conceived, none of those babies. All of those babies have a father. Where are you? Where are we? It should be criminal to leave a woman in that condition. I think the church should push for stringent, more stringent laws that hold men accountable to women. Rape should be an abomination in this society. Rapists getting out in three years of prison. Rape was a capital offense in Israel. You use women in this way, you only attribute to the death of these babies being aborted. Men. We must not abandon our children's mother by divorce or by sexual exploitation. We must speak also for the unborn. Do not be, be quiet quiet because you don't have a uterus, men. That is, the, that is the most foolish logic the world has ever heard. It doesn't stand up at all to logic or reason or your calling. Defend the indefensible, men. Defend children whose lives will be taken away from them, who are innocent in that regard. It is for men to stand up and defend those who have no defense. It is for us to fight battles, not women. I don't want my, my daughters being drafted one day in the military. And that means it's for us to stand up and speak out, men. Don't be pushed into a place of cowardice. Speak. Speak with love, but speak with clarity. All right. Wow. This is going long, isn't it? Finally, 
Mothers and would-be mothers must face motherhood with understanding. There's some women in here that will be mothers yet. Face it with understanding. Face it with joy that that's how God has set you apart in his created and redemptive purpose. And it won't be easy. It will not be easy. But trust God that it'll bring much joy and much satisfaction. One of the things that's very telling are the statistics that tell us that women will get uh, degrees, multiple degrees. Uh, our Supreme Court Justice is one such uh, example. She's sitting on the Supreme Court, one of the most brilliant judiciary minds there is, and she loves being a mother. She was not an absentee mother. She was an involved mother, and all her children have grown up and speak her praises. It won't be easy, but it will be good to be a mother. Do what is good. And to the church, then, because we know of these things, we know that we are with, never without hope, even when it comes to the most difficult news regarding pregnancy, regarding our children. And the church, therefore, should play a vital role in assisting one another, helping one another. You know, you look around, I look around at you and I see those who help us in our parenting, necessarily. I want you to be part of my children's lives. This is the household of the living God. And I think our children are blessed to be integrated in it and you to be part of their lives for good. And finally, mothers who have aborted babies need to be told that there is yet good news. Many of them live with the greatest shame and despair that any of us could ever know. And they need to be taught that God loves sinners and gave his only son so that all who believe in his name will have eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. We know women who have had abortions. I know, you know women who have had abortions. I know Christian women who have had abortions who are children of God and who are committing their way and everybody who knows them knows there is good news. This is not the end for you. This is the beginning of everlasting life if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the news we need to hold out to mothers who have had abortions. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word.